Well, good morning. I'm Bill, as Jeff said, and I'm the campus pastor at the downtown campus. And it is good to be back with you this morning at Bellevue. This is awesome. Um, I want to say a special welcome, uh, since this is our first morning that we're doing the techie thing and streaming Facebook Live. Uh, a special welcome if you're following uh, with us online, either through our stream or through Facebook Live. Uh, good morning. We're so happy that you're tuning in. And uh, thank you to all of you as well. Um, so it's been a while since I've been at Bellevue. How are you all doing? Good, good. That sounds good. It sounds like most of you are doing well. Um, I'm glad to be back here because I have something really exciting to share with you, something really interesting that I've been wanting to say, and God has uh, been doing something in my life. He has been talking to me. God has actually been talking to me. And I know this sounds crazy because, like, who is talked to by God, right? But he definitely has. And the weirdest part about this is that once I recognized it as God, I began to realize that he does this all the time, and it's been going on for a while. God is actually speaking. He's speaking. And uh, they sent me downtown for the last few months, and I've come back to tell you this strange and wonderful message, that God still speaks. Okay, so in fact, as we open up God's word together to Psalm 19, I think you'll begin to understand what I mean. So if you have your Bible, uh, you can open it to Psalm 19 now, or you can follow on a mobile device, or grab a Bible in the pocket near you, or um, in, the, in the chair pocket, not your friend's pocket, okay? Let's not get weird, okay? Um, grab a Bible near you, or you can follow on the screens as well. Now, I'm going to read Psalm 19 in just a minute, but first I want to point out something to you as you open this text. If you were to look in your Bible, you would read this, and you would see that it says, for the director of music, a psalm of David, okay? For the director of music, a psalm of David. So this part, we usually don't concentrate on this part of the psalm, but there's some interesting pieces of information that come out from this. First, the psalm is actually written by King David himself, and second, it is intended for the director of music. And I say that because this psalm that was written by King David would have been used for worship in the assembly of Israel. In other words, this is not just words that are written that we've put in form that we read now, or just some kind of poem. This was an actual song that was sung by the congregation of Israel. Not only that, but what's really interesting when you look at this psalm is they weren't just used in King David's era, they were actually used in Jewish households throughout history. So after David compiled the psalms and it became part of the literature that in the word of God that they were using, they would have been commonplace. In fact, many Jews would memorize the psalms as part of being a Jewish person. In fact, Jesus himself, we know, memorized the Psalms. And we know this because there are multiple times where Jesus uses the Psalms. One in particular is when he's on the cross. Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's actually quoting when he uses that from Psalm 22. And so as we continue on in this Psalm series, I want to remind you that these are songs of worship towards God. So don't just study them like they're a college textbook, but use them in your worship towards God this summer. And as we'll see in just a little bit, God speaks through his word, and he speaks through his psalm. In fact, this morning, he's going to be talking to you about what's going on in this psalm. So keep that in mind as we read Psalm 19. This is what it says in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech, and night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived from its warmth. 
The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, the honey that comes from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own heirs? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Well, today you may have noticed that the sermon title is God Talks to You, Will You Listen? And so we're going to discover three ways that God communicates to us according to his word in Psalm 19. And the question that you should be asking yourself this morning is if it's indeed true that God is talking to us, then the question you should be constantly asking this morning is, how well are you doing at listening? How well am I doing at listening? All right, let's jump right in with this first point. God talks through his world. God talks through his world. Look in verse, for, look in verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the works of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, and night after night they reveal knowledge. The basic part of this, or the basic premise of this part of the passage, is that God's world is always speaking to us of God's existence, of his glory, and of his workmanship. Listen to the words that David uses to talk about how God's world speaks. It says, declare, proclaim, pour forth speech, reveal knowledge, their voice goes out. David is pointing out and highlighting that the very world in which we live in is constantly telling us of God's glory and the works of his hands. It is giving us knowledge of God. When you walked outside this morning to go get into your car, the world was speaking to you. It was shouting at you. It was telling you that there is a God, that he exists, and that he created all of this. Now, this may seem kind of mysterious to us. What do you mean that God is talking to us? I know when I, didn't, when I woke up in the morning, I didn't hear the sun go, Hello, Bill. God exists, and he is full of glory. Okay? I don't know why the sun sounds like that. But I didn't hear that. Okay? I didn't hear the sun say that. And if I did hear the sun say that, then I'd probably need to have my meds adjusted, right? But yet, David says that the world is speaking to us. So what is happening? Well, in order for us to really understand this, it is really helpful for us to look at the characteristics of this speech that we find in Psalm, in Psalm 19. This is what it, so here's some characteristics. First, you'll notice that David identifies that the speech that's going out from creation as constant. It's constant. So day after day and night after night. The sense sense that you're supposed to get is that this speech is always happening. There's something that's um, intricately and intrinsically built into this world in which we live in that is always speaking of God's glory and his workmanship. In other words, when we witness created things, it is always talking to us about him. You know, if you were to talk to some scientists throughout history, you would see that a lot of them would confirm this. Now, we often associate scientists with, like, atheism and science and only materialism, but there's been a lot of believers who are also scientists throughout history. Uh, One of them right now, actually, who's living right now, is Francis Collins. I don't know if you know that name, but uh, Francis Collins uh, undertook uh, to lead up something called the Human Genome Project. It is the largest project, research project, that has ever been done in the history of man, and it was all set on doing the, uh, uh, on actually mapping the human genome. 
And Francis Collins is a believer, and part of the reasons why he believes in Jesus is because of his work looking at the, most, is the smallest, most intricate thing that we can see, which is DNA. And so um, he mapped the human genome, and he is a Christ follower, but it's not just him. Uh, Christ followers throughout history include Newton and Francis Bacon and Kepler and Galileo. All of them believe in God. And it's really easy to see why, because when you think about what scientists study, they study the natural world. They're constantly looking at the world, and they're trying to figure out what's going on. And all the time, they're studying and observing the world around them. They're constantly being, being bombarded with this idea that God exists, and that his glory can be known through his creation. The order in the systems of the universe, the complexity of life, the laws of physics, and even the beauty of the landscapes that we look at all speak of God. A scientist who studies the cosmos sees the greatness of an infinite God, and the scientist who studies the tiniest aspects of our world under a microscope also sees the amazing power and order that makes up all matter that comes from God. And so no matter where you are or where you look, God's world is constantly talking to you about him. Creation cries out that God exists, that he is the creator of all this, that he's real. The second characteristic of this speech is that it is silent, but it's still very real. In the passage it says, they have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out. That kind of reminds me of like a riddle. Like if you were to make up a riddle about this, what is always talking but doesn't use words and never, never makes a sound? Well, it's creation. You should try that on your family members who are not here at church later today. See if they can get the riddle. I bet they won't. But what David points out here is that even though that the knowledge is not in form of audible words, it is still very much real. You know, I grew up doing a lot of canoeing and hiking. Uh, and doing it with camps and churches. And one of the things that we would commonly do when we're out in the middle of the wilderness uh, would be this idea of a solo, okay? They called it a solo. And basically, a solo was where you would take um, a kid or a camper and you would um, put them in their own little territory on a trail somewhere, and you'd give them a few supplies, and you would just encourage them to just hang out there for like half a day or maybe a whole day. And I always noticed that like this was always at the point in the week when the leaders were getting really sick of us. You know, they like put us out on the trail like, oh, you're going to be alone for God reasons, right? And they'd always put us out there. But anyway, nearly every time I did this, it was a really profound experience. There's just something about being away from the busy world in that, which we live in and technology and all of those things that makes us start asking the bigger questions about life. I mean, honestly, there's been times where I've been in the middle of the wilderness and no one is around, and I start looking around, and I'm taking in everything, and I can't help but ask, is all of this really here by accident? Could it be? Am I here on this planet by chance? Is this all some kind of random cosmic joke? And I don't know what it is about the solo time, but I always end up, you know, after a few hours doing the same thing in my solo time. I, I end up just sitting down and just like looking at like one little square foot of earth. And the crazy thing is that if you ever do that, if you ever get a chance to do this, you're in the middle of the wilderness nowhere, and you just look at this square foot of earth, you'll notice something that's really amazing about our planet. It's that no matter where you look, almost no matter where you look, you see that it is teeming with life. The more I looked at the square foot of earth, the more I see the plants and the dirt that has microbes and bacteria in it, and fungus and insects and animals and worms and all sorts of things in this tiny square foot of earth. It's teeming with life. And that life is always in the middle of nowhere, right? It's in our yards, but it's also in the middle of nowhere. And I can't help but think and feel and hear from the multitude of life that I see in that square foot of earth that there must be a God, that there must be a source to all of this. Why would life be like this on earth without God? And so it speaks to us, not an audible sound, but a knowledge of its, and it's a present, and it's a constant knowledge that God exists, that he created all of this. The last characteristic of these words is that they are all-encompassing. Look at the verse again. 
It says, yet their voice goes out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. God created the world in such a way that no matter where you are on the planet, you are reached with its message. Their words go to the ends of the world. And this part of the passage can really remind us of another passage in Romans. Okay, Romans chapter 1, 20 through 23 talks about this idea of creation speaking out as well. And it says this, For the creation of the world, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor they give thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. You see, since the very inception of this world, it has been clearly speaking forth that God is real, he is divine, and he's powerful. Everyone from the time that they can think on their own gets that message from God and his world. They all get that message. The problem that's highlighted in the passage is not the message itself, but what people choose to do with it. In other words, some people choose to interpret that message and they began to attribute the beauty and the splendor of this world to creation or to people or to something other than God. People would rather attribute that, that beauty and that splendor of this world to something called Mother Nature than to God the Father, Christ the Son, through the Holy Spirit. And we see that in our day today. And so as you consider the world constant, that the world is constantly and clearly speaking to you about God, I want to encourage you this morning, do not block your ears to its message, and do not attribute it to anything else. When you were driving to church this morning, did you look out your window and say, wow, God exists. He is there. He loves me. He created this world. He wants me to know him. Did you say that? Because you should be. We should all have that attitude as we look at God's creation this summer. I encourage you to go out and spend some time in creation hearing about how great God is, how powerful he is, and how good he is from creation. The Lord is speaking through his creation. When we receive that message, it should point us back to God. So God is talking through his world. The question is, are you listening? That brings us to our next point. God is talking through his word. God also talks through his word. Look at verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. A good, a good way to understand this psalm is really seeing it as a progression. You see, we just talked about how God's world speaks to us of God's existence and that he's full of glory. And this is called God's general revelation. In other words, it's revealed generally to people all the time that God exists. But once we understand that there actually exists a God in this universe, then it should lead us to some other questions. Questions like, what is God like? And maybe even, what does he want from me? And this is where David in the Psalms transitions from a general revelation of God's world to a special revelation of God's word. Now, David uses the term God's law. And I want to address that for a second. When I read this multiple times, I kept thinking um, as I read this about the rules that God lays out in Scripture because David used the word law, like the Ten Commandments or Leviticus. But as I was studying this psalm, I began to gain some deeper understanding about what David is actually saying. You see, the word in Hebrew for law is the word Torah. And Torah to the Jew doesn't just refer to laws or rules, it refers to God's word as a whole. I point this out because as modern reader, readers, we might think that David is just saying, oh, how great it is to have a bunch of rules from God. But that's not what he's saying at all. David is saying that the revelation of God's entire will through the words of Scripture is complete and perfect. That's what it is. After all, if you just had a perfect rule book to live by, that's not very inspiring. But 
if you could hold in your hands the written will of God that was written by him through human authors, wouldn't you want that? Wouldn't you want to know what God says to us and how to live our lives and how to see the world? That is something to pay attention to. And so all these terms in the passage, when he says law or statutes or precepts or commands, they're all really referring back to God's word as a whole. So now that we have that understanding, let's take, the, let's take a look at the benefits and the significance of God's word for us. You know, one of the best ways to get um, your arms around this section of scripture is to diagram it. And it's really easy. You just list all the words that identify God's word in a column, and then in the next column, you list descriptions, and the third column, you list what God's word does. And so, you take a look at what I did. You get to see my chicken scratches this morning. Um, I should have been a, a, a doctor or something, right? It's like hard to read, but that's okay. You get the idea here. Um, I basically just took each Uh, piece of that, and I did subject, description, and what it does. And so for this part of the Psalms, it really helps us to see um, kind of the full picture of what David is saying. If you look in that first column, he uses all the words to describe God's word. Now, you have laws, statutes, precepts, commands, uh, fear of the Lord, and decrees. Now, the one that's different there is fear of the Lord. But fear of the Lord is what you need in order to approach God's word the right way. And so even though it's a little bit different, it's still referring back to what we need in order to approach God's word. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And so in order to understand God's word, we have to have that respect and that awe of God. Okay, so that one is pretty straightforward. But then the next column are all descriptions of God's word. Of God's word. God's word is perfect. It's trustworthy. It's right. It's radiant. It's pure. It's firm. It's righteous. It's pure, and it's sweet. Now, we could go through each one of those descriptions and talk about them, but instead of that, let me just ask you a question. You personally, when you think about God's word, when you uh, just try to picture in your mind what God's word means to you, do you actually think about God's word with those descriptions? Is that you? Do you really think about God's word in such a light that you love it that much? Because I know and you know that there's a lot of people who see God's word as an obligation, as something that they should read and follow but don't really. A lot of people feel guilty when they ponder God's word, or other people are skeptical or critical. God's word is not often seen in the best light. And yet David clearly has cultivated a passion and a love for the word of God in his life. David says, They are more precious than gold than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than the honey from the honeycomb. You know, I'll be honest, I love God's word, and I've cultivated a passion for it, but I don't know if I can accurately say that all the time I feel the way that David does about God's word. There are some times where I struggle, just like everybody else, but guess what? I want to. I want to love it and cherish it just like David does. And honestly, I've come to understand that that doesn't just happen, right? Like, we don't just wake up one morning, and all of a sudden we have this deep, abiding passion for God's Word. You know, there are some Christians who I've talked to who that's part of their story. They share their testimony, and they're like, and then I got saved, and then the next day I woke up, and I just read the whole Bible. And I always want to say, I hate you. You know, like, (laughs) now I don't really hate them because I'm a Christian and all that stuff, right? But— but people say that, and I'm like, I don't get that at all. I don't understand that. People who just wake up and read their Bible, and it's not hard for them, I don't understand that, okay? You're a better person than me, all right? I'll give you, I'll give you a, a gold star for that, okay? But for the rest of us who are not like that, uh, we need to cultivate passion over time. And you ever notice in our culture is that our culture really loves lists. You ever notice this? Go online sometime and just read, like, one article, and you'll find that, like, lists are the most popular thing on the internet, okay? So it's, like, uh, a list, like, five ways to wear a scarf, or uh, top ten Father's Day gifts, or uh, 37 million ways to appreciate your pastor, you know, like, things like that. (laughs) 
It's insanely common, okay? So this morning, as we talk about creating a passion for God's Word, I wanted to give you a list so that you could follow along with it, but you would actually have something practical to walk away with. So these are five ways to cultivate a passion for God's Word. This is where you get to uh, move from just hearing about what's happening in this passage to a, a thing that you can do in order to apply this passage, okay? So number one, obey God's Word. Now that seems really obvious. How am I supposed to do that? Like, it's so hard to think about God's Word and to obey it. But here's the thing. If you go to God's Word and you're intent on looking at what's there and changing your life based on that, and you actually go and do it, you take action, what you will see happen is that you get the blessings and the benefits from following God. And when you see that blessing and that benefit, it cultivates a deeper passion for God's Word. So try to obey God's word. The second one is this, grow with God's word. Now this is an attitude that you go to God's word looking for help to grow as a person. This is a humble attitude that says, I know that I think wrongly about a whole bunch of things in my life. I know that there are sins in my life that I struggle with. I know that there's things that I just have completely wrong and I want God's word to correct it. And so you go to God's word in order to grow with God's word. The third one is this, invest time with God's word. It can be one of the hardest habits to learn, but get in the habit of going to God's word on a consistent basis. Now, I'm not going to tell you that you have to wake up every morning and spend X amount of time in God's word. I think preachers have said that a lot. And uh, people say that all the time, like, you have to do it this way or you're doing it wrong. I just want to take the guilt away for a second and just tell you, you need to find for you how to get a daily or, a, or an every other day or whatever rhythm you find yourself in. You need to find a rhythm and a way to get a steady diet of God's Word. It has to be there. You need it in your life. And can I just blow something out of the water really quick? I just, I just want to address this. In our culture, uh, if you look at advice out there, you're reading these lists on the internet I was talking about, they're always telling you, uh, you should only do what you're passionate about. Don't waste time doing things that you don't like doing, okay? And so we have this in our mind that, uh, and because we're entertained all the time, we have it in our mind that every time we do something, we have to like it, okay? Every time we do something, we have to be encouraged by it. Every time we do something, it has to feel good. Can I tell you that when it comes to God's word, to throw that out the window? Because it's not helpful at all. It's not a good excuse. If you've been telling yourself that, I just don't like this, it's not for me, blah, 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 that's just a lie. Don't believe that at all, okay? Because the reality is, is that there's a lot of things in life that we have to do because we're, we need to do it, not because it feels good. And I'll give you an example. Um, I don't actually love eating broccoli, okay? I don't, right? But I eat my broccoli on a consistent basis. Why? Because coniferous vegetables are really good for you, okay? And so it's the same thing with God's Word. It may not always, you might not always wake up, or you might not always go to God's Word and be super excited about it, and be zoned in, and, and just be in a flow state with God's Word, and that's okay. You still need it. You still need it to be part of your diet. It has to be part of your life. That's what it means part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Okay, sorry, I got a little preachy there for a second. Um, but the fourth one is this. You need to use God's word when you're in trouble. Seriously, when you're in trouble and you're facing things in your life, go to God's word and begin to trust in it. It'll help you to build confidence in God's word. And the last one is this, to share God's word. When you go to God's Word and you are, maybe you're at church and you hear something that encourages you, hopefully you hear something that encourages you this morning, guess what? You should be sharing that with other people. That's part of being a Christ follower, is to share the truth and the conviction and the encouragement that's in God's Word with other people. Find somebody to share it with. All right, so now the ball is in your court with that, and you can pursue that. Um, I hope that you do. But let's look, take a look at this third column so we can finish this part of the psalm up. Uh, what is it that God's word does? Okay, if you look at that comment, it says that God's word refreshes the soul, it makes wise the simple, it gives joy to the heart, it gives light to the eyes, and it endures forever. That's what God's word does. Now, 
We could go through each one of those, but I think we would run out of time. So instead of doing that, I want to give you just this quick pitch on why you would want to build a passion for God's Word in your life. Listen carefully. There are a lot of us who are tired. Who are, who's tired this morning? Okay, there's a lot of us who are tired. There's a lot of us who feel like we're out of ideas. There's a lot of us who have a tendency to get down and overwhelmed about uh, circumstances in life. Many of us are coasting, and we don't even know where we're going in life. But listen to how God wants to use his word in your life. Cultivating a passion for God's word can help make you whole. It pulls your life together. It points out the right road ahead. It shows the way to joy. It helps us to see clearly. It even comes with a lifetime guarantee. God's word is better than a $20 million bank account. It's sweeter than the red ripe strawberries in summer with whipped cream. Making God's word primary in your life helps you to have the best life possible. Notice I didn't say the easiest life possible, but it helps you to have the best life possible. Jesus said, I have come to bring them life and life to the full. If you're not living that, you need more of God and God's word in your life. God wants to communicate to you through his word. He's trying. God wants people to flourish and to do well. He wants us to thrive, and he's given us the written revelation of his word to us. The question is, what are you going to do with it? Will it collect dust? Will you ignore it? Will you prioritize everything else but it? You know, the, the reality is this morning that God is talking through his, wor- through his word. The question is, are you listening? That brings us to our final point. God talks to and through his worshiper. Verse 12. But who can discern their own errors? David's asking. Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So this interesting thing happens when we come to the word of God and we encounter him. You see, David makes it clear how beautiful and awesome God's word is because it's derived from God himself. But immediately, David begins to understand that he has a problem on his hands. You see, when we go to God's word and we encounter God, we are left with the reality that we are in no way worthy of what the words of scripture say. We start to realize that our sin problem is so deep and it's so far-fetching that even if we wanted to correct every sin and confess every sin in our life, we wouldn't be able to. You know why? Because we don't even know all of them. They're hidden from us even. We can't even discern all of the things that we've done wrong and to grieve God. And in that moment, God is saying something to us. He's talking directly to us. God is telling us that we can't follow him without his help. We can never hope to perfectly follow God on our own. And so the reality is, is that we are always in constant need of him. In fact, this is why Jesus had to come, because we are so broken and sinful that we could never pull ourselves out from that. Jesus is the only one who could live a life of perfect obedience to the Father. He was and is the spotless Lamb of God, a perfect sacrifice on our behalf. It is only God who can fix our sin problem. And we don't just need him when we put our faith into him initially, when we come to salvation. We need him constantly in our life. And so David's response to understanding what God's word does in his life is just perfect. David says, forgive my hidden faults. Keep me from intentionally sinning against you. Help me to stay away from great transgressions. Lord, make it so that what I say out loud and what I think and I feel on the inside are things that are pleasing to you. You know, the reality, church, this morning is that there are too many of us who are trying to bear the burden of this life alone. Even if we know God, we are still keeping him out of the the equation. And part of the reason for that is we live in a Western world in which we prize, above all else, rugged individuality. 
We believe in the self-made man and the self-made woman. We hate asking for help. But if you are listening to God and his word this morning, you have to know that that path doesn't work. And so my encouragement to you is to stop trying to do your spiritual life on your own. Stop leaving God out of your marriage. He is there. He's not just here on Sunday morning or when you read your Bible or when you pray. God is in the midst of your marriage, and he wants to help you and come to your aid through his word and his Holy Spirit and through the church to help change things and make them better. Stop leaving God out of the stuff that's going out on at work. Stop leaving God out of your finances and out of your parenting. Stop trying to muscle things out on your own. Stop being the lone wolf. Listen, you constantly need divine help in your life. You are built for dependency on others and especially God. You know, one of the great criticisms of Christianity is that we, that people say that we use God as a crutch, to which we should always say, amen. Because guess what? I'm broken. You're broken. We are all weak people in constant need of God. You know, God is not just a crutch. He's actually the strength and the power behind all of it. God is talking to and through his worshiper, and he's saying, listen, you cannot do this life without me, so stop trying. And so this morning, God is talking. He's talking through his creation. As the sun rose this morning in the sky, and as you drove to church, and you looked out the window, and you saw the birds and the trees and all of God's nature, it was speaking to you, and it was saying that God exists that he's here, that he's powerful, that he's mighty, that he's full of glory, and you can know him. But God doesn't stop talking there. He's talking to you in the rich, life-giving words of Scripture, and he's saying, I love you. I've sent my son for you. I want to be with you. I want to show you the way to the best life possible. And finally, he's talking to you as his worshiper this morning. He's saying, you can't do this without me. So just stop trying. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Listen, church, as you leave church today and you go from this place, don't think that God is staying here in a building. Don't think that God only speaks from a pastor who stands on stage or from the words that uh, I say from God's word. Understand that God is always talking to you. He is speaking through his creation. He's telling you that he's real. He is speaking to you from his word. He is telling you about his will and his revelation for the people throughout all history. And he's talking to you personally and telling you, you can't do this without me. This morning, God is talking to you. The question is, are you listening?